and on in that area. I'm trying to remember, we moved your trap um, to yeah. the airport in Sandusky, and I can't remember what the pattern that was the same this fall. Yeah, you, you had a little bit smaller peak, but yeah, you had the same date of the peak and everything that I have in East Lansing, it, or it was Midwest wide had the same peak. Yeah. So you know there is there are there are there are good fungi out there. Now probably of greater concern because I think we're managing aphids pretty well and we have some germplasm that that's uh, coming out is western bean cutworm. This is a pest that's native to the western plains like Colorado, ne Nebraska. It was found feeding on beans in the late 1800s or early 1900s, and then on corn in the 1950s. And it has stayed out west until about 2000, when it rapidly moved east. And it, it's unusual in that it feeds on a grass, corn, and it also feeds on a legume, which is dry beans. It does not seem to do well, or it's not able to complete development on soybean. And it not only causes yield loss by eating, but it creates holes in bean pods and in, in corn, and you get these areas right around the hole where you get fungus. And we had a lot of challenges at the end of last year with uh, quality of corn, and this just enhanced the problems by opening that, that ear up. So just a brief uh, little diagram. What is it doing now? It's under the soil, and it prefers to get down deep. The deeper it can go, the better, because it will survive. And it's not quite pupating yet. It's kind of a, a larvae, and it looks kind of like a crinkle-cut french fry. And it's alive under there. It, it's aware of things. But if it can get down 12 inches instead of 3 inches, it'll have better survival. They pupate quite late, like June, like a month later than European corn borer. And then the adults come out and mate. You get egg laying. And then finally you get one generation. So there's only one generation of this pest, but they're like huge corn borers and they eat a lot. So they're pretty devastating. And this year we even saw larvae even into September. And then those larvae drop to the ground and form this little cell and they're just sitting there at this point. So in corn, it does this kind of feeding where you maybe it's only eaten a few kernels, but it's left an area, it's full of uh, what we call frass, which is insect poo, essentially. And you get a lot of fungus in there, and sap beetles, and a lot of secondary problems. And in dry beans, it creates holes in pods and eats the beans and opens up the, the pod. We don't know why this pest moved east, because it's already happened, so it's after the fact. But one suggestion was we planted enough BT corn that we've reduced the numbers of corn earworm. Corn earworm, for those of you who grow sweet corn, Earworms are the big colorful worms that get in the tip of the ear, and they're, they're cannibals. They will eat anybody else that is in that ear. So earworm is actually a predator of western bean cutworm. So by planting a lot of BT corn, we've cleaned up those ears really well, and uh, we just don't have another pest that has been eating them. The other thing we don't do anymore, again, because of BT corn, a lot of us are planting it, and out west particularly, they're up to maybe 70% of the acreage, uh, with be, with be, be planting a BT corn, people aren't spraying corn anymore for corn borer. And out west, they used to spray for corn rootworm. They used to do area-wide spray applications in August with spray planes over wide swaths of Nebraska to kill adults, and they don't do that anymore. So we're not spraying corn. We're not getting any kind of late season control. Also, this thing is under the ground in the winter, and we're not doing fall and spring tillage like we used to for a lot of good reasons. But the downside of that is anything that overwinters in the soil or white grubs and things like that, you just tend to have more problems with. And uh, you can throw climate change into every discussion of anything, I guess. But we have uh, been able to document milder winters, and this thing is overwintering, and you know maybe that's something too. So in this region, in Michigan, Ontario, Ohio, this is a garden spot, a potential garden spot for this pest. Now that it has gotten here, we have a lot of sandy soils in this area along the lake shores. And also in the middle of the state, we have areas like glacial outwash areas from the uh, times when the glaciers were, were, were here. And that probably increases overwintering survival. Because if I can get down 12 inches instead of 3 inches, I'm not going to freeze during the winter. We have a lot of acres in reduced and, and, and uh, 
produce tillage. Again, we're not bringing them up, we're not killing them in the fall and the spring. We've got our lake effect snows for people that don't live near the Great Lakes, they don't really understand what is lake effect snow and how you can get a big snowpack, especially along the outer edges of the state for 30 miles in, and that snowpack, again, warms that ground up underneath, keeps it warmer, and probably increases overwintering survival. A big thing is probably humidity. Out west, when you talk to the entomologists in Nebraska and Colorado, it's dry out there in many places. They have to irrigate. And if I'm a moth flying around, I can dry up very quickly. If I'm a little egg mass, I can dry up quickly. And if I'm a little larva, I can dry up quickly. So we have higher humidity that probably increases survival. And we have both corn and dry beans here. So we've got uh, bo both hosts. So uh, our trapping network this year had these milk jug traps with a pheromone hung right under the, uh, the uh, cap. And the male moths come in. This is at night. They have to find the female by a smell, essentially, not sight. They think that they're finding a female, and they get in here. And yesterday I said, once they get in there, you know, male moths don't ask for directions. So you see, they get in there, and they get confused, and then they die. And we can collect them. And here is a, a student checking some traps. And this is early in the season. They're happy about this now. They're having a lot of fun. But it wasn't so much fun later in the season. That was because the trap catch in Michigan was a whopping uh, 20, almost 28,000 moths total. Some of them you got, so I, maybe you got some over in this way. Uh, Huron County had, had quite a few. And here are our states now. Last year, the furthest east that we had trap catch was about right here in Ontario. And this pest has gone from this area here to Pennsylvania out to the eastern edge and over to Quebec. So next stop is the European Union, is what I think. I think it's France or something like that. Uh, so we just crushed everybody else. First of all, I had a few more traps. I had, we had almost 300 trap sites. But even if you factor that out, in the trapping network across the whole US, we had the highest trap catch, if you look like per county or whatever. Uh, we wiped everybody out. So this is a pest that is uh, doing well in Michigan, it's just invading Michigan, and it would tend to have higher, higher populations for these first few years. So here's a close-up, and wherever you see red was kind of, uh, or if you're colorblind, maybe it's gray. Uh, we have these areas along the lake. What do you have here? Sandy soils. You have areas, and you have lake effect. So you can probably get really good overwintering survival. Central part of the state here, sandy soils again, some irrigation, they really like irrigated areas. And again, I think it's the right soil type. And you have dry beans as well as corn. Now over here, we're just starting to pick moths up in this area. And these are, I, I haven't had, have you had reports of damage after the fact at harvest? Martin, or where's Phil at? Um, There's um, one or two sites, I guess, that did have some damage. So you, you are just right on the front wave of damage. And if you go over here to Ontario, they're, they're picking up larvae in fields, but nothing like what we've seen over here or over here <coughs> or in this area this year. Now, I'm not going to talk about dry beans here, but if you go to one of the other pest management me meetings or the, the dry bean meeting that Martin is going to do next week or the meeting that we have on Monday, I have a whole slide set just on dry beans and what it does in dry beans. So this is our, if you look at when did they move around in Michigan, in the western states their peak emergence is usually middle of July, and that's when they have, and then they have problems into August. Ours, and in Ontario and in Ohio, ours has shifted a little bit more into August, and I wonder if that's because we have some dry bean areas, and it seems like we have just an extended life cycle. We first caught them in June, the, f the first few, and they were still going in September when I just gave up. I was teaching and I just said, oh, forget it, let's just end it. So we have a few out here and I don't know what they do because the larvae uh, that are produced then, I don't think can make it through the winter. But we're talking, you know, first week of August as being a really prime key flight time and then you would go out and scout corn after that. Um, I did look at some of the aspects of the life cycle, which appears very different from the West. So I actually took egg masses. Here's an egg mass that I, the people in the front can see. I've cut that out of another corn plant in Oceana County. 
and I've driven it back to East Lansing and pinned them with a straight pin onto these plants exactly where I want them. That's how I can infest plots intentionally and not bring them to a grower farm. I can br bring them to the campus. And I could watch these egg masses hatch. I could count them, how many egg eggs hatched. And then I could cut, I, I probably pinned about 100 plants. And then I cut sets of 10 or 12 of them every so many days. So 1, 5, 10, 14, 21, and 28 days after hatch, 